This is smithy.tv. Hi, I'm Pat Mastriani, and welcome to Smithy TV. And uh, welcome. This is my very first premiere episode of my show. And uh, who better to have here with me today than my best friend, Seelix Say Sinassi, better known as Yik Yu from Degrassi. Dude, we've Hello known each there. other for what? 25, uh, like more than 25? 27 years. 27 years. We met in 85 or 86? 86. 86. We uh, basically got to be friends during the uh, Degrassi casting workshops uh, back in the day when we all auditioned for the original series. We, uh, you know, we're just kids out of local high schools from across Toronto, and uh, about 50 of us were chosen out of about 500 applicants to participate in these um, workshops, basically to see what we could do, if we could actually take direction, and if we had any natural yeah, skills. Yeah, it was basically like natural selection, they were just weeding out the bad actors. Basically, it was the first survivor, really, because <laughs> yeah, I mean, we basically thought, you know, there was only a few uh, characters that were actually written for the show, Joey Jeremiah and Yik Yu being two of the yeah, six. Stephanie. Whatever. Stephanie Vula, you know, a couple of other ones, and um, you know, you and I basically, well, everybody was kind of fighting for a role, and you well, almost, I was pretty much given there. I, only, I was the only Chinese guy around, so I think uh, well, there was another <laughs> guy, but really, he had no shot of getting the role. Yeah, but you, you were the only professional actor of the group. I mean, I remember back in the day when we were all talking during the workshops, we we're like, you know, Selig actually did a movie. And, um, you know, you were the one that actually had professional experience and, and had actually worked in the industry where most of us were just green and had no idea what to expect. And um, one of the things that I, I really love telling people about is that movie that you did. <laughs> How old were you when you did that? Uh, 11. You were 11 years old. You did a Canadian iconic film called Peter Solution. And here is a quick clip from that movie. What do you mean? The truth. Come on, what'd you do? Oh, look at that. I can almost see it growing. Good stalling. Now, how did you make it grow? This. My secret recipe. Yeah, where'd you get it? It's a long story. I'll tell you later. Put that on your head? Does it hurt? No, but it's dangerous. Let me try it. Why? You don't need it. You got lots of hair. Sure, but... But what? I'll put some down there. Are you crazy? No, no. Get out of here. Let a guy do it. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> that was 28 years ago. No, you said you were 11 years old when you did this film. And um, you obviously you Im you immigrated to Canada at what age? I uh, yeah, immigrated, immigrated to Canada, to Canada, Canada uh, from Laos when I was 5 years old. Um, my myself, my parents, and seven other siblings. I'm the youngest of nine. My eldest sister stayed back in Thailand. But uh, yeah, so and then I'll tell you how I got in the movie. I was uh, in grade I believe grade five at that point. I was in the gifted program. Mm -hmm. Whatever that means. Not the special program, but that, no, good. not the short bus program. Okay. The gifted program. <laughs> um, and somebody came to our school and said, "I need uh, a kid." who can miss the last three months of school and not fail. So the entire gifted program auditioned for this. Movie. Oh, so they didn't necessarily look for an Asian they, person. Well, well, at that point, all the entire gifted program was Asian. Were Asian. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not unlike but, today. Yeah. So, yeah, basically, and I think it was 5,000 people. Because it was film shot in Montreal. They auditioned everybody in Montreal. They went to Quebec City because it was a Frank, it was a... French production company, co-production, co no, no, like French, as in like French Canadian, yeah, um, and then they came to Toronto and Ottawa, and I think out of the five thousand or whatever, uh, I got called back to go. Just for your role, just for my role. Wow, Good for an Asian kid, that's huge. It was 1985. Right? Yeah, I was one of the first Asian people to be on TV. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't remember ever hearing about another like co-starring role for yeah. an Asian person in that yeah. genre. And I was like number two on the call sheet, I think. So yeah, I was like you know, you know, you co-starred that film. Yeah. It was awesome. And yeah. I mean, you weren't even a union member at the time. No, no, it was non-union. Uh, the show was union though, so I got. Yes, I, I, but it was a French union, so I was put in, I guess I bought into that or whatever, but 
Yeah, it was, it was a different time though. I mean, think about it now. Like this, the way that it all kind of rolled out was I auditioned, and I remember this. This is bizarro. This might seem like the craziest thing right now, considering it's 2013. But uh, on a Saturday morning, I got a phone call. I remember this vividly. I got a phone call telling my my parents didn't speak English at the time. I never really actually spoke English, but I told my bro my eldest brother that they wanted me to go to Montreal to uh, to for the callback to act with the other kids to, as a tryout, yeah. basically. And that there's an actor named Michael Logan who was going to come pick me up in a cab in about an hour. <laughs> so I was 11 years old. Cab came. My parents let me go in the cab. Some strange white dude. Some strange people. white guy. Uh, flew to Montreal by myself at 11 wow. with Michael, who's really nice, yeah. super great guy. Um, we stayed at the hotel. You know, we checked into a hotel. Got picked up. Checked into the hotel. And met with the director. Um, and the other two actors that were, you know, slated to, and we basically had a workshop. Yeah. So we went to... Your to poor parents, I mean, you know, they didn't speak English. You don't have a re representation. You yeah, have I'm, I'm the youngest of nine. They're like, ah, whatever, whatever. they lose one, we got eight more. <laughs> <laughs> one less mouth to be. But again, like, it was a different uh, time. Absolutely yeah. different time. I remember uh, early on in the series of Degrassi, I was... You know, traveling from North York, uh, which is yeah. a suburb of Toronto, and would have to take the bus in the subway. I was only 15 years old, um, and I know today, I guess 15 seems quite old. The kids are pretty savvy, but I was a very naive 15 year old back then, and going downtown in the hood of Toronto to this production. Well, the office, East End, which was you know it, not a nice neighborhood. It wasn't a nice neighborhood back then, or, or yeah, still. Today. I was I was 12 when we started that show, so yeah. same thing. I took the bus, bus. the subway to the East End, and that was it. We basically traveled ourselves down to the production company office, mm -hmm. um, do these workshops after school yeah, uh, for three. Three weeks and then we eventually casted the show and then we basically ran from there and I, I remember you and I basically bonding over the Janet Jackson song Control uh, <laughs> I, I had my old Sony Walkman and you and I were sharing earbuds oh, at the time I remember that. and we were like we did on the stairs right? yeah by the <laughs> stairs to the uh, you know, and, and I thought I was so cool that I could do that oh, yeah. back then. And I thought, this guy's pretty cool, you know. We bonded over some music, and then we obviously bonded. I and mean, you are a social butterfly, Silk. Yeah. And I, you know, in the 28 years that I've known you, I don't think I've ever heard anyone ever speak ill of you in any manner, in any way. Everybody Other than ex-girlfriends. Well, well, forget about ex-girlfriends. They don't count. But, you know, obviously everyone gravitates to you. You are a social butterfly. Uh, everyone loves working with you, loves hanging with you. Right. Uh, I mean, I even mentioned that in my best man, uh, best man speech at your wedding. Yeah, that uh, was my best man. I was his best man. Last fall. And I just said, it's amazing that people let you get away with the shit that you say. Uh, in, Do you remember in, that? In remember the, that we had this conversation. Sorry, no, no. We had this conversation. I was working on, I'm an assistant director now, for you guys that don't know. But uh, behind the scenes, I'm a third AD. And Pat and I were joking about this, and I was doing some, oh, what was it, Hades Factor or something. It was some MOW or, or miniseries or something. And Mira Servino was in it, and and I'm like, oh, well, you and Pat, you had this thing that you created on T-shirts, and I was like, oh, you know what we should do is create a T-shirt that says "Fat Girls Need Love Too." Now we're at the set, so we did it, and I went to set the next day, and everybody's like, what is that a quote? But no, it's just a T-shirt. They're like, really? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, they're like, what are you gonna do if a fat girl comes up? I'm like, well, give her a hug. Give her a hug. Needs love. <laughs> Like, who doesn't get fired for that? You are, he is the most um, politically incorrect person yes. I know. Offside. He uh, speaks his mind and doesn't matter to who it is. It could be the producer of a film, a director of the film. It could just be a group of people together. Uh, you literally don't hold back. I mean, I remember a while there we were calling you angry Chinese guy because uh, literally everything would set you off. Um, you had a short fuse when it came to... You weren't very tolerant of people who are ignorant or people who behave in a stupid manner. Yeah, yeah. And you're going to make a great old man one day. You know, that's going to be awesome. Yeah, Get awesome. off my lawn! <laughs> but for some reason, this translates in the work environment to people giving you a lot of respect and a lot of credit. Because not only do you do your job well, people respect you for that, but they appreciate your honesty. And um, well, that has done, done very well in this industry. No, absolutely. But I think it's also, you know, the, the, it's not like the lack of respect. It's not like I'm being disrespectful. No. When I say things, half the time it's with a smile or mm -hmm. sarcasm or whatever. And it, it's all, like, we all know. With a hint of truth behind it. Because you absolutely. say what people are thinking. Is. Yeah, I'm the guy that says, you know, everybody's thinking it. I'm the guy that has the balls to say it. Yeah, I mean, you know, in a joking way or sometimes not a joking way. But I mean, you know, it's, 
there to make plans. You told me an hour ago when we were having lunch that basically you were asked to come and speak at the DGC negotiations. We don't have to get into the details of it, but you know, here you are. You're just a, you know, you work behind the scenes. You're a third AD, but people want you in these negotiations with the with the IPA, which is the Independent Producers Association, to speak on behalf of the people that are you know at your level and lower. Um, and, and that's amazing that now you can actually represent the people that you work with. Which is fantastic. It's a, it's a testament mm. to people's respect of you. Thanks. And um, I also wanted to ask you because over the last ten or has it been ten years you've been now working mm -hmm. behind the camera mostly. Yeah, ten years. You committed over yeah. ten years ago to working mainly behind the camera. Um, you've done a lot of Canadian productions, American productions, and what are the similarities and what are the big differences that you've noticed in, in, in this industry when it comes to Canadian and American productions? Uh, the majority of it just comes out of budget. Mm -hmm. like, I mean, you know, like I've, I've been doing mainly features, American made features and studio features. So um, yeah, it's basically just budget. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, American films, Canadian actors, yeah. you know, King Cobra, whatever, whatever. But it's just uh, I think the main difference is just it just comes out of budget. They just have more money, and which makes it a better quality or or just more convoluted in terms of the amount of people in that. Not production. necessarily. Better. I mean, the, yeah, I'm sure the toys are bigger. There's more of it, and you know the effects are you know bigger. Um, it's just bigger, well, not necessarily better. Like, I mean, we've done stuff that is you know. What fresh. was that switch for you ten years ago, where you said, okay, you know what, I've been doing this acting thing since I was 11 years old. Now I'm prepared to do something behind the camera. Because I mean, we've had other uh, friends of ours from Degrassi that have made that transition early on. People like Darren Brown. Um, yeah. Where what changed in your mindset? Because for me, it's always been about the acting and nothing else. Um, what what made you decide I want to go behind the camera now? Uh, I was tired of being a bartender. Mm -hmm. I had a mortgage, yeah. and it was you know it just wasn't not feasible. That was another thing that I didn't mention was that Celic and I, after Degrassi ended, uh, started working at a restaurant called Max's at Bayview Village uh, in the suburbs of Toronto. We were hosting and bartending and. Uh, waitering, waitering management, um, and I, not not because of the great money that we were making yeah. back then. It was mainly we needed a social group. Uh, you know, yeah, it was it paid the bills and uh, and we had some great friends. And we went drinking with them, right? and, and a lot of those friends we're still friends with yeah. today. Actually, yeah, uh, a lot of our yeah, yeah. and and uh, you know, it just it was funny that you and I basically spent the entire '90s together. Um, almost daily, yeah. uh, either I was picking you up or you were coming by my place and sleeping over for the week. And mm -hmm. literally, he was like an adopted child. Uh, yeah, I call his parents, mom and dad. Mom and dad, and, and there's a photo that's going to be thrown up of us and, and you and my parents. And um, you know, literally, you were you know my brother, and, yeah. and still are. And it was just amazing to sort of have that because I'm an only child, but to have Seeluk, uh, I couldn't have picked a better brother ever. And uh, it's just amazing to see how successful you have become in your industry behind the camera. And just a little bit more about what a third AD does. Oh, God. Because it's going to segue into my next question. Oh, okay. What do we do? Uh, well, mainly we're in charge of all the background. We set the background. We're in charge of the response, like the continuity of it, uh, picture cars, uh, deal with the cast. Um, and basically, as an AD, we, we're middle management in the sense of like we run the set and we are the information people. So my department, we're all about making sure that every department's on the same page, what we're doing next, what we're currently doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just sort of... You're a worker ant, basically. Yeah. The first AD is... The first know, AD, you know, he, he or she schedules a show and, and runs the day, and I'm their right-hand person on set. So, like, when we're, you know, doing a big stunt, you know, the first AD's in charge, and then I'm next in line. And I'm safety, like, you know, there's other, other safety people, but I'm the safety guy also. And I'm the last person to walk in and out. And, and what advice would you give to someone who might be watching who's like, I want to get into this industry and, you know, I've gone to school for it. I've gone to film and television school, but now I can't seem to get into this workforce. How did you sort of break into it and what advice would you give to someone who wants to start at the bottom? Start at the bottom. You know, you really got to dig down and figure out what you want to do. Do you want to become camera? So you should join the unit 667. Do you want to become a technician, lighting, electrics, set deck, art department, whatever? You know, do you want to go name back? Do you want to go IA? Uh, read into that. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to be an assistant director, accountant, whatever? You know, then you got to join the DDC. So there's all there's like you know three or four different unions that you really have to get 
and two, let's see what's feasible for you to get into because a lot of it, the, the, you know, there's fees to join the union, and especially coming out of school. Like, I mean, the, the fees can be pretty hefty. And, and I think people have to have a certain sense of reality about what they're going to actually yeah. start off doing when, if and when they do get on a set. Because a lot yeah. of people think, well, I went to school for four years, I should be making the big money that's and great. getting all the responsibility that. You yeah, know. that's great. You're going to show up on set as a daily AD, and you're going to sit at in the end of an alleyway yeah. that smells like piss. And or you're going to run and get coffee for some Yeah, time. and you're going to have to lock up there for four hours and until I tell you you can move. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not an easy industry. It's not glamorous. If it was easy, I, I guess yeah. everybody would do it. Yeah. And, and the thing is is that yeah. the, the hours that you work are ridiculous. I mean, for an actor, basically, we show up when we're told to show up on set. It could be four or five hours into the day. For me, yeah. um, you know, for me, it could be a six-hour day. It could be a 12-hour day. But for you guys, you're almost there. Well, I, the... the, 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 the Give you an example of the most extreme that I've had. I was a daily on Cinderella Man, so we had a thousand background in uh, Maple Leaf Gardens, and it's a 1920s piece. So we had 17 daily ads and hair and makeup. I don't know, maybe 35 of them, not including wardrobe. So there, were, you know, a hundred, a hundred people working. Let's just say about six hours or seven hours before crew call. So we would get there at five in the morning. Crew call would be noon and we'd shoot for 10 hours and then we would wrap out all the background which take three hours so it'd be you know 18 19 hour day and then you'd have to come back and you know you'd have five hours off six hours off hmm. so i mean that's an extreme yeah but i mean you do basically when you sign on as an ad as with the directors guild of canada your work week is 70 hours. That's what you paid for. Yes. yes. And before you go in overtime. And you work hard for like three months straight, but then you can actually take a month or two off you, if you have that luxury. Yeah. Depending yeah. And where you, you just roll in and roll in. Tony won't because if you're starting out, you're not going to be able to take that month off. He won't no. be able to afford to take that month off. So yeah. even though there's a lot of time, you're basically making just a little bit of a minimum wage at starting out. Anyway. So you've been doing it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you happy with it? Are you happy with where you've gotten and what you've accomplished? I mean, where yeah. do you want to see yourself in 10 more years? Ten more years, I'm hopefully going to be a dad, <laughs> and uh, I will, will, my deal with my wife is that I do one movie a year, so hopefully in ten years I'll be a first AD, I can do one movie a year, and spend the rest of the time being a stay-at-home dad. Stay-at-home dad? Uh, and your wife's going to be okay with that? Yeah, that's the deal. That's the deal? That's the deal. <laughs> <laughs> if I could go to Clay, she... Now, my, I have one last question here for you, buddy, because I, I, I saved it to the end because I wasn't sure what the deal uh, was in. Yeah. Uh, see, like, uh, like I said, got married last fall. And uh, to a wonderful woman in Crisula who's Greek, and you actually had to become Greek Orthodox yes. so that you could get married in the Greek church out of respect for her family, and, and you, you made a promise to her dad, which I thought was totally cool. Um, tell me a little bit about what that was like, and then I'm going to ask you one last question. Which baptism? No, 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 no. What was the whole baptism process like for you to, to, to tr um, become Greek Orthodox, and uh, oh, was it worth it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love my in-laws. The whole family is fantastic. I, I, I yeah. say that not because this is on air, but I love the dad. Yeah. I love my yeah. in-laws. Um, but Father Odessa was, uh, Father O was fantastic. He basically gave me a pamphlet, a booklet of about know, 80 pages or so. Yeah. But it's basically just the history of the Greek Orthodox Church and yeah. Christianity. And, yeah. and, he, and we basically had classes for like, what is it, two-hour classes? Mm -hmm. We just basically sat there and read it together and if I had questions, he would just basically, it's a history class. Yeah. So we did that for, I can't remember, six, six weeks or something, eight weeks. Yeah. I remember you going to those classes. Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, and then, you know, he started off with, uh, every, every time he does a catechism, he's like, you know, everybody has a choice about the end of the class, you know, like you, you have a choice of either converting or not converting. Mm -hmm. And he, of course, he said, well, knowing your father, well, I know what your choice is, so don't worry about it, we're all good. <laughs> Yeah, so now does this mean because you're Greek Orthodox <coughs> and Priscilla's Greek Orthodox, I'm not allowed to be the godfather of your child when that happens? What's the deal um, with that? Yeah, actually, I talked to the father about that. Yeah. Father about that because I know that was, I think it's going to have to be the same thing that happened with, at the wedding. Okay. With the, com, with the Kumbaro. Yeah. The best. Explain what happened there because they don't know what we're talking well, about, right? Okay. Uh, oh, Jesus, fucking religion. Um, <laughs> Pat is my best man. Right, always been my best friend. He's my he was my best man. But because I was getting married to Greek Orthodox Church, um, there's also a thing called a kumbai, mm -hmm. which is basically a sponsor for the the couple that's getting married. The newly like the godfather. The godfather. Yeah. My, so basically, this other couple is our guidance couple. Yeah, whatever. Let's make it simplify it. Yeah. So Eleni is Greek, 
And her husband, Steve, isn't Greek. He's Catholic, though. So Eleni could sign the paperwork, and Steve wanted, of course, he's as his wife, and he takes that, you know. And so the father was, it was very touch and go there for a while, so I was like, well, he's also... But he let it happen. He let it happen. He let it happen so that he could stand by you, and I got to stand by you at the... At yeah, the, at but the, which took a little bit away from you yeah. from being the best man, but now there's two people that are my best man. Didn't bother me at all. Maybe. What I want to know is when the kid comes. When the kid comes, comes I will... Uh, if you're gonna, you're definitely going to be the guy. Am I running? You are. All right. But it's also, it's going to be... Shared. That's okay. Shared responsibility Shared and responsibility. Because you know it's going to be like eight kids, right? You've told Priscilla that you guys are going to have at least eight. <laughs> yeah. Big family. Yeah, right. So there's plenty yeah. of godfathers to yeah, We'll see around. after the first, the first kid. Okay. But then again, see, the, the good thing is she's got twins on both sides. So if, <laughs> if, if we have twins off the top, then we're gold. You might be better than you got better than. All right. Okay. Buddy, thank why can't you just be a godfather? Just then why does it have to be sanctified by the church? It has Come to on. be. It has to be. Man. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the law. Right? <laughs> but thank you so much for being my first interview it wasn't even like it was an interview just us hanging out talking and uh, come back again and, and uh, we'll talk about other stuff and next time you want to come visit please do Absolutely. and thank you for watching and we'll see you next time on Smithy TV and the Pat Mastriani show cheers thanks